a video about electrolytic capacitors and how to measure the leak inside such a capacitor. I've tested all these capacitors a few days ago and I throw them all away. And the most important thing is that the, there is a too high DC resistance between the electrodes of that electrolytic capacitor and that in relation to the voltage. I will explain that later. At first, um, about such an electrolytic capacitor, this is a very old book from the 1950s anyway, the principles are still the same. Uh, this talks about the, capaci the capacitance related to the um, surface and the thickness of the oxide layer and that's one very important thing when we talk about electrolytics. Uh, an electrolytic capacitor consists of, as far as I know, two uh, aluminium plates immersed in an electrolyte. That electrolyte is a fluid or it is a paste, uh, but uh, there is some moisture necessary to give the capacitor its properties. Because the oxide layer inside the uh, capacitor, the aluminium, uh, is responsible for the capacitive effect. And when that oxide layer is etched somewhat, the value can get bigger. The electrolytic effect, the capacitive effect can get bigger. And you see here also the replacement schematic for an electrolytic. A resistor and a capacitor. So inside all these capacitors um, is in many cases a very thin foil of aluminum and it could be that there is moisture inside etc. Um, well, a good way to test uh, an electrolytic that can be done with DC and you take a neon tube a resistor and set that neon tube and the resistor in series with the electrolytic on a DC source of a high voltage of course. When the neon light lights up there is leak inside the uh, electrolytic capacitor. Here in this beautiful book, Radio Laboratory Handbook, it's a very interesting article. This book is of the 1940s about condenser leakage and you see here how they do that. At first the capacitor is charged to the positive and then the switch is switched to another position and then the capacitor is discharged through the grid. That means that the grid uh, receives a positive voltage and that means that an anode current starts to flow. And that current is visible with the milliampereameter in the lead between the cathode and the anode. That means that the pointer of the meter moves to the right and slowly moves back to the left side. And the time during which it falls from maximum to minimum tells us about how much charge was available in that capacitor. And the formula is also here. Very simple way to do this test. And this is the transistor circuit that in fact does the same. We charge a capacitor and electrolytic positive during a certain time via a resistor. Then we switch, connect the switch to the base of the NPN transistor positive charge gets into the base of the transistor. A current starts to flow here. That means that the milliampere meter moves out from the right slowly to the left side. And there's also a certain time that tells us about the um, capacitance of the electrolytic.
um, there is with electrolytics always a parallel resistance between the positive and the negative and that has all to do with the properties of the electrolyte. But the ideal situation of course for a um, capacitor is that there is no DC resistance at all because a capacitor consists of two completely isolated plates. This is for instance a non-polar capacitor. When we measure here DC resistance the capacitor is surely defective. I want to demonstrate that first. We have the ohms meter. By the way this is the test circuit now what I'm going to do. Ohms meter. Uh, we charge the capacitor first. Here of course it's positive and here negative. Charge the capacitor first. Then discharge it over the meter. And then look what it tells us. A capacitor of 50 microfarad, 4 volts. Uh, take the probes from the meter. Don't do this. One finger here and one finger there because the resistance of your body is now present. So you can hold that cap with one hand here and here. And you see the pointer of the meter, the ohms meter move. Here you saw a very slight movement of the meter. We go higher, again a slight movement. Again. Now we're going to measure the, we have charged that capacitor and now we're going to measure the DC resistance with the probes to the connect uh, electrodes of the electrolytic cap to the positive here. And because we've, we've charged it, the meter fierce moves out, but now it stands still on a certain DC resistance. And in this case that is 2 multiplied by 10, that's not much, 20,000 ohms. That means that when you use for instance this cap, I take another one, it falls on the floor, sorry. When you use this cap here in the circuit, there is a parallel DC resistance of 20,000 ohms. That means that the capacitor surely leaks a lot of current through the ground and also part of the current goes here but it leaks and that makes it in a certain way not suitable. Uh, I have to say electrolytics always leak and then especially um, the high microfarad capacitors, for instance this one, 470 microfarad. When I do the same I test it on, the, on its um, leak. You'll see the same now on the meter. Yes, that's the correct. So this, this also leaks and you even don't see the pointer move. That means that it has a very high DC resistance. There's also a relation to the voltage to where the capacitor has to be used. A capacitor that has to operate on a high voltage of course may not have a high DC leak because otherwise it's in fact shortcut by a resistor so it cannot fulfill its capacitive properties in its fullness. It is as if you, you have here a parallel resistor and that means when you measure high voltage electrolytics you will see that the DC resistance is always much higher compared to low voltage electrolytics. And I hope that I have a, a good one to demonstrate that. This is a 50 volt. You will see the 
the pointer go back further and further and because all these capacitors were defective their DC resistance was too high but for a high voltage uh, electrolytic it's good it works when the DC uh, resistance is in the mega ohms range 1 mega ohm 2 mega ohm for lower voltage um, electrolytics it's good when the DC resistance is say 500,000 ohms or so that are good values so let's see what happens when we charge a non-polar capacitor so when this capacitor is good there must be absolutely no DC resistance here but we can charge it of course this is one microfarad 250 volts you can see the pointer move but it falls back when I reverse it it falls back again again the same procedure so we see here that this foil capacitor has an endless resistance and that's good so when I have the choice for instance for a 1 microfarad electrolytic on, on 200 volts or the 1 microfarad non-polar cap I choose of course the non-polar capacitor it has simply better properties in general of course it could be that you need an electrolytic but anyway so the general rule when you measure non-polar caps there must never be DC resistance and when it's there throw it away that's the only advice that I can give and an electrolytic especially for instance on a high voltage 200 volts when you see a too high DC resistance and you can use Ohm's law when you apply it in the DC circuit you know the, the value of the parallel resistor and then you know whether you can use it or not so let's test this 220 microfarad 200 volts uh, you can see that the pointer moves slowly back and I think that this capacitor is not suitable for a high voltage application because its DC resistance is quite uh, low important to tell electrolytics when you lay them on the shelf their oxide layer inside deteriorates and that means for to get the best properties of an electrolytic you have to connect it via a resistor to a voltage source to format in a certain way the uh, capacitive process inside so it could be that this, this electrolytic now shows this DC resistance that's far too high but when I have it for one hour on a uh, voltage source say I use uh, 20 volt and a resistor of 1k could be that we have here a better reading but anyway I don't trust this so this is also thrown away so that was more or less all to tell of course we can also talk about the AC resistance of a capacitor but that's not the aim of this video the AC resistance here's the formula to calculate it when you do that for an electrolytic you will see an extremely low uh, um, resistance AC resistance they, they uh, always talk say that this is a fictive resistance but you can really make a, a capacitive voltage divider when you connect two capacitors to an AC source for instance two 1 microfarad capacitors in series to an AC source of 50 Hz at 60 volts and you will surely measure uh, 30 volts at the node where these two capacitors are soldered together
and of course for low value caps. Um, that will be another problem because that effect is related to the frequency. When you uh, connect to one nano five capacitors in series, you also have a capacitive voltage divider, but it will not work on 50 Hz. Well, that was more or less all to tell. Uh, all almost all capacitors have these three electronic properties. Inductive, resistive, capacitive. So uh, a capacitor is uh, never only capacitance. There are other sources. So, back to the book from where the inspiration was given. Beautiful old radio book. Bought it on the flea market. A lot to learn, a lot to test. Especially because all these tests are so very, very fundamental. And uh, of course nowadays uh, there are more modern um, ways to test components, but the laws are the same.